Hi everyone, welcome to another of our video interviews here at Artemis and in light of having to postpone our in-person ILS NYC 2022 conference to April the 22nd uh, after the emergence of the Omicron variant of the pandemic, we decided we'd run some video interviews with the kind sponsors of the event to showcase their thought leadership and to also thank them for their support. So tickets are still available for the in-person conference in April. Please do visit the Artemis website and you can secure your place at the event today. And for this, our first of the virtual ILS NYC 2022 event videos, I'm delighted to welcome Tom Johans, our head of PCS, part of the various group of companies and our headline sponsor for the conference. Tom, great to see you as ever. Likewise, Steve. Good to see you too, man. So we're looking at the development of the insurance and securities market with one eye to the future, as is the way with all of our events. And to that end, Tom always has some interesting insights and highly relevant views to share on issues that perhaps people are not as laser focused on as we see in ILS markets with cat risk. Um, but today, Tom's going to talk about political violence and also a little bit about cyber terrorism, two areas of the insurance market that are certainly not staples of ILS, but that Tom believes could be in the future. And in particular, Tom believes that recent trends are driving increasing risks of political violence around the world, unrest, and also cyber attack risk too, which obviously makes risk capital and efficient risk transfer products to address these exposures increasingly important. So, Tom, people will have obviously heard our conversations a number of times. You're a regular visitor here to our video interviews. And to begin, I thought it'd be really good to just hear your overview of why you feel political violence is such a hot topic right now and why the industry should care. Why should they listen up and care? Well, because there are a whole lot of people in this industry who are up to here in PV risk that's not easily hedged. So when it comes to NatCat, you know, we all know the drill, right? You write what you want, you retro out the back. Maybe, you know, retro is a little tighter than usual. Maybe you don't get all the cover you want, but you're able to manage because the retro market is robust and ongoing. You can trade ILWs. The modeling's mature. Yeah, there's a market there. With political violence and cyber, cyber terrorism, that whole kind of bad guy sector, the retro is not there. So, you know, if you're writing underlying business, political violence in particular, that is two, three online, sometimes less, how are you going to go out and buy a hedge for five, six, seven, nine online from a collateralized market, right? That can't write this two and three online stuff. Terror is capital inefficient. Political violence is capital inefficient. This stuff is highly correlated with just about everything. And probably not as far out in the tail as you think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're writing to online business, you're not really able to use that underlying capital as broadly as you might like. And if you're going to hedge it out, you're going to have to hedge out to somebody who needs to charge more for the risk because it is capital inefficient. So why is political violence a hot topic right now? Because there are a whole lot of people who wrote it. And there are now a whole lot of people who need to lay it off. And there aren't a lot of places to do that. I've gotten more calls over the past six weeks on political violence ILWs than I have about Ida. Very interesting. So this is uh, similar, similar to when we've spoken about broader cyber risk before, that there's a bit of an issue up at the retrocession side of things, which is hindering reinsurer's ability to do more, and as a result, hindering the insurance market as well. So it sounds like this is something that is happening across this segment of, as you put it, bad guy covers. Um, now, if we look at some of the news around the world, um, there's pretty much talk of unrest in a lot of places right now and um, recent events in Kazakhstan are a good example of what can happen um, but does that sort of event really matter in the context of the global insurance and reinsurance market are these are these still pretty small overall your your standard myopic political violence underwriter will say it is small it doesn't matter right you know this is a country with what 18 19 million people uh, very low insurance penetration. Uh, it's landlocked, so you don't have the same marine implications or marine exposures. You know, there are a lot of reasons to dismiss the riots in Almaty from a week or two ago. The problem is that 
A, it's indicative of a broader range of political instability, and B, the insured loss is more than you think. So when looking around for data on the Almaty riots, I found a disclosure by the Kazakh embassy to Switzerland detailing the economic losses from the major retailers. There are about $100 million in economic losses strictly to the retail sector. These local retailers are bigger than you think. I mean, we found one that had just did a major AI, uh, retail AI licensing deal with a Western uh, analytics company. So if you can buy that sort of sophisticated retail capability or technological capability, chances are you're insured, right? So we took a, a wild guess that it's probably 50 to 100 mil insured loss, which think about it in the US, most of our SRCC losses are small, are under $50 million, right? Take out 1992 in LA, take out 2020, uh, the George Floyd riots. And the overwhelming majority are well under 100 mil. So for a 50 to $100 million insured loss potentially to hit Kazakhstan, that's big, right? Mm. And then it fits into a continuum as well. So when we see the year kicking off with a riot, even if it's in Kazakhstan, it's still geopolitically significant. It came roughly a year after the riot that kicked off 2021 uh, in Washington, DC. So at a minimum, it says, yes, the world is still a dangerous place. It also indicates that insured losses can come where you don't expect them. And thankfully it stuck to Almaty. Uh, there was some amount of oil and extractives industry disruption because the trains were affected by the riots, which required uh, and extractives companies to reduce production because they rely on rail because Kazakhstan is a landlocked country. So, you know, had that been worse, okay, you know, once the extractives get hit, you know, 50 to 100 turns into 500 to a billion. So, you know, again, you can say $50 million in a small country in the middle of nowhere not a big deal for the reinsurance or ILS market. But I say, look at this and take notes. Would you rather learn from a $50 million guesstimate insured loss so that if something happens in Western Europe or the United States again, you're ready? Or are you going to dism dismiss this and allow yourself to be surprised later? And given the risk environment and worry, and I'd still call this peak peril for political violence, you know, I'd be taking notes on everything right now. And personally, I am. Mm. Yeah, no, it's interesting you mentioned supply chains there as well, because obviously that's a, an extremely hot topic um, economically and in the insurance market these days. Um, there seems to be a supply chain crunches or pinch points happening everywhere, which all seem to flow back to the insurance market in some way uh, in terms of interruption um, or knock-on effects of higher costs and things like that. So um, yeah, political violence certainly could be a major source of additional supply chain business interruption, I suppose. Um, from your view at PCS and the wider Beres group, what's the sort of event trend looking like in political risk right now? We see a serious concentration starting in 2019 and moving forward to today. Um, obviously, 2019, you had the Chilean riots, which were at the time the largest insured loss from SRCC. Uh, you also had the Hong Kong riots that year, just shy of 80 million insured. Uh, there was a Colombian loss, I think it was around 50 mil USD. There was significant economic activity to Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, Latin America had some serious riots in 19. Uh, 2020, the main was, of course, the George Floyd riot in the United States, which was almost as large uh, by industry loss as the Chilean riot. Uh, you also had a lot of economic activity or riot that wasn't insured, but still indicative of the threat environment. Philadelphia in October, Chicago's Magnificent Mile in July. Um, yeah, you know, there were scattered riots throughout the year in the U.S. in 2020. Uh, there were also knock-on protests from the George Floyd riot in Japan, Australia, UK, continental Europe. So it, 2020 was hardly quiet. Right? And then in 2021, you know, we had the uh, Colombian riot in May, 
it was estimated 150 million USD. We were thinking, okay, you know, the world is still a dangerous place. You know, that followed, of course, the Capitol riot in January, which was not an insured loss event, but was, you know, certainly a geopolitically significant event. You know, but following Colombia, which we were ready to say, okay, this makes the risk still relevant, came South Africa, which we're currently informally estimating to be three to three and a quarter billion USD, making it the largest SRCC event on record. Um, it, the generous reinstatements on the Sazria pools reinsurance policy uh, program were a big part of that. Uh, the Sazria RAP, formerly known as the Emerald Facility, was also significant. And there was probably 500 to $700 million worth of um, difference in condition uh, written relative to the uh, South Korea program. So a lot happening there. Yeah. And then, so, you know, that's the main one from 2021. We come in and we see Almatia come right away. You know, we've got further risk of political violence with troops along the Ukrainian border. Now you, you look at that and you think invasion or you think war, but the reality is uh, the COVID spike in Russia right now may mitigate the risk of a traditional armed invasion because troops don't fight well when they're sick. So what does that leave open? Um, unconventional approaches, including uh, fomenting civil unrest, um, particularly through disinformation means, not to mention um, direct cyber operations that could constitute state acted, uh, such as you know, kind of state acted terror, state sponsored terror. So in addition to the insured losses that could come from a cyber attack in lieu of a physical attack. There's also the knock-on attack, uh, knock-on effect of SRCC following an event like that. So the U.S. is still you know, grappling with, with issues around stability, you know, particularly during an election year, during the investigation of the January 6th riots. There's a lot going on right now. And then in continental Europe, we've had wave after wave of protests um, from you know, the Netherlands straight out through Vienna and beyond uh, related to COVID restrictions. You, you've got you know, signs of instability with Orban in Hungary and also in Poland. And those are, you know, the further up the, the Danube you go, the more economically and insurance-wise insurance significant those uh, Central European countries become. So the, the notion of a contagion of SRCC crossing the Danube into the likes of Germany or Austria is uh, certainly a relevant concern. So mm -hmm. the world is still a dangerous place, Steve. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I mean, you've just, you've just detailed well over 20 or 30 major events over the last few years and a significant amount of threats ongoing um, to companies, organizations operating all over the world as well, which... Um, which means cyber, um, sorry, political violence underwriters have really got to have a good visibility of the the threat sort of profile, what's happening country by country, but also the data and see how these can flow through to the insurance market in future, which is which is often not so easy with a class of business like this. Yeah. Now, when we talk about political risk, we can't really do that without throwing cyber into the mix. We've already touched on it, but um, is cyber a specific threat vector that you think people should be looking out for in 2022? I mean, obviously we have some events ongoing related to Ukraine, which you mentioned for the uh, the potential for invasion, but obviously there's, there's now a large cyber if, uh, event ongoing in that country, which potentially could overspill, I guess, into other areas of the world too. Is this a real concern? Yeah. So the, the short answer is yes. And the long answer is yes, with me just talking more. Uh, you know, <laughs> I need to introduce some levity here. Otherwise, we've got what close to a half an hour of me giving you the most depressing perspective on the dangerous conditions in the world around us, right? Um, I do think that a cyber event of the political violence sort could occur this year. Now, what's interesting is I, I want to be careful to segment cyber terrorism from cyber, right? Because there are two different types of risk. And, you know, as well, like I'm talking to a lot of uh, potential ILW counterparties right now. And one of the things I've been emphasizing is if you're going to do a cyber ILW, for example, 
build in a hard exclusion for cyber using the cross-referencing of PCS cyber and terror bulletins. So basically do, do your cyber ILW, just like a, a single event affirmative, right? But build in if the event, the cyber event also has a cross-referenced bulletin in PCS global terror, then exclude it, right? I, I think if we can treat um, cyber attacks or losses from cyber attacks differently from losses from uh, cyber losses from political violence, it makes it easier for the market to write both PV and cyber, right? And you're at least segmenting them so that you're not going to get double whacked. You know, you're reducing some of the correlation risk. I mean, you, you can manage the risk and gamble more easily under those circumstances. Uh, back to your main question, it, do I see uh, the cyber attack vector to be escalated this year. Yeah, I think so. Um, there are two ways I see it manifesting. So it would require two different approaches to risk transfer. One is your standard cyber attack, right? You know, the, the standard, you know, state actor or state engaged actor brings down the grid. And it, it's important, right? So when you look at action, I, I see a, uh, kind of three types, right? You've got state actor, state sponsor, and state accommodated. So state actor, um, you know, think back to, you know, the Democratic National uh, Committee's hack, or even not pet yet, where you had the likes of Fancy Bear, Guccifer, which were really personas fronting for uh, government operators, right? That's state acted. State sponsored would be you know, the state engaging a third party and saying, go do this on our behalf, right? The analog being state-sponsored terrorism. And the third would be state accommodated, which is what we're seeing a lot in the uh, ransomware environment right now. Uh, it, it helps to trace back to the June 1st, 2017 speech Putin gave in St. Petersburg, where he said that, you know, no, we are not telling these people to conduct cyber attacks, but you know, if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling patriotic and want to defend your country from the reputational abuse it's sustaining, then who am I to stop you? So, you know, you can, in the state accommodated model, the state says, do what you want outside our borders. We're not going to mess with you. You can use your our banks without your assets being frozen. You can, you know, live freely and comfortably, but once you leave our borders, there's not a whole lot we can do for you. So most of the ransomware work has been state accommodated. And I think that the move towards state sponsored or, or state acted, I do think seems to be ticking upward this year, given some of the moves we're seeing on the map right now, particularly uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan um, with foreign troops being brought in to stabilize the situation. Uh, so that, that is a concern. The other threat vector for state sponsored or state accommodated is information warfare or information attack, uh, which would be you know the dissemination of propaganda or information designed to destabilize. That wouldn't be a cyber insured loss should it occur. More likely, you would see something manifest as SRCC, where you have destabilizing propaganda pumped through uh, a local state. Uh, folks respond to that uh, with protest or riot. Insured loss comes from SRCC, even if such activity was fomented through misinformation. Yeah, interesting. Lots of lots of connections going on there as well between essentially political violence and cyber risk. Um, the two seem yeah. to be hand in hand these days in this digital age. Um, so when it comes to the current marketplace for political violence, insurance or reinsurance, um, what do you think holds back its development? Is it is it purely a capacity issue, or is there are there other things underlying the marketplace? Uh, uh, capacity is part of it, but you know when you kind of look at you know capacity rate and terms, right? You, you change one, the other two affect, right? If you you know tighten up your terms, you're going to see you know potentially a rate movement, or you may offer a certain amount of capacity under looser terms, but a, a big slug would require something tighter. And we are seeing issues around all of this right now. I, I think the biggest challenge in the market would be probably BI, 
uh, business interruption. Because, you know, when you think terror, for example, you know, the standard reinsurance discussion is massive explosion trophy target. Times Square, Rock Center, um, Lloyd's Building, Eiffel Tower, um, you know, Brandenburg Gate. Now, when you think about how a terror attack would probably be executed, particularly given the trend towards small arms over the past 20 years, I don't see the trophy target as the major driver of insured loss. I, I think that you could go and attack major retailers. And you know, if you attack you know, four big box retailers, uh, the chain will probably shut down maybe 100 exposed other locations with the agreement of insurers, which leads to a significant uptick in BI. You know, if you've got you know, five retailers, each with 500 million in limits, you, know, you could see a, a limits loss of two and a half billion off mostly BI that way. And you know, what do you need? You need enough PD to trigger the BI. But uh, that can come from stores burning rather than, you know, uh, 250 meter blast radius. So, and have you know, profound insured loss consequences. So I think coming to grips with the change in how the loss would occur is one of the bigger problems. Um, coordinated threats are always an issue. Although I, I would say that some of the more fantastical views have to be dialed back a bit. So if you were to say, you know, if there were an attack where you had, you know, Rock Center on Monday, Lloyd's on Tuesday, La Défense on Wednesday, uh, call it Potsdam or Plots on Thursday, and um, I don't know, let's go with Istanbul, uh, Central Business District on Friday, right? After the Monday attack in New York, every other major city in the world is probably going to hard right? It's going to be tough to move around. I mean, I remember riding the subways in Manhattan after 7-7, and we saw law enforcement all over the place because there was an attack in London. So we, you know, the U.S. officials think, okay, we got to be vigilant here. We don't know what's going on. So we protect everybody. Cool. So if there's a rock center attack on Monday, the, you know, UK, London's going to be better protected than it was on Monday, right? It's going to be a higher level of vigilance. So let's assume for, for some reason that the Tuesday attack occurs. La Défense is difficult to get to on a good day. <laughs> After two day, back-to-back days of major Western city terror attacks, La Défense is going to be a fortress. You know, so, and, and then you know, after that, Potsdamer is going to be locked down. Like, it, the notion that you can see, you know, daily major terror attacks occurring in rapid succession, I, I find to be probably unrealistic relative to, you know, the, the $1.5 to $5 billion uh, industry loss strike price as we normally see in the ILW market. Um, you know, folks are so worried about the, fantastical end state that I, I think they stop thinking about the usefulness of the cover. And we see it in cyber as well, right? What if every major cloud provider comes down at the same day? Well, if that happens, man, I'm moving to the mountains. I'm getting my canned goods and you're never going to hear from me again, right? You know, the, the notion that the major cloud providers could be taken down at the same time is, you know, a, equivalent to a, a massive digital assault on most of the world like that it's not a casual thing so I, I think when we look at some of these ilw strikes we need to be realistic about where those thresholds sit relative to you know, what could actually happen and a, a two billion dollar terror strike or a two and a half billion dollar terror strike is the strike price is remote it's a regulatory capital or a rating agency capital trade it's not like a, a Florida 20 wind, you know? So, yeah, you know, with that in mind, you know, how fantastical do you want to get, right? Let's, let's treat the one and a half to two and a half as the remote risk that it is, particularly with certain things excluded and get on with trading so that the market can function properly. Right now, if you're knee deep in PV, 
you you may hedge some, you may not. Um, but you could very well be in a situation where you're just going to white knuckle it through the year and hope nothing bad happens. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we were talking earlier, Steve, since 2019, the world's only gotten more dangerous. Like, is this really the year you want to go in white knuckling PV? Mm-hmm. I, I don't think so. That's interesting because it's it's almost a corollary to um, the the issue that we currently see with some some markets and secondary perils who who cannot buy the aggregate cover that they used to be able to buy and so are probably going to be white knuckling it through periods of the year such as the tornado season in the U.S. and the wildfire season in Ca- in California yeah. and and just hoping yeah. there aren't too many smaller events and and some of that is yeah. is a lack of appetite. But it's also maybe a lack of imagination around some of the uh, protection products that are available, that they're not really serving the needs in every case of the, the buyers. Yeah, imagination's going to all the wrong places. You know, let, let's not think about all the cloud service providers going down at the same time during a massive cyber attack on the energy grid and a multi state invasion. All right, let's. Mm-hmm put that intellectual effort into figuring out multi-billion dollar Texas and Oklahoma hail. How about that? Let's put it into sorting out, you know, five to $10 billion wildfire. Now, or dare I say it, maybe we should think about flood, right? <laughs> or in, in the PV space and, and the cyberspace, let, let's think about, you know, these two, three, four, up through five and six billion dollar single risk law, uh, single risks or single events, right? And it, how to hedge them properly and how to develop a market for them. You know, that's what we need right now. We don't need reasons not to write a type of business. We need ways to write it profitably but meaningfully. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned ILWs a couple of times earlier, but um, what about? Sort of the capital markets, insurance linked securities. Is there is there room for ILS involvement here? I mean, I would I would say yes from a point of view of the type of catastrophic capacity that's required. Um, but from a correlation point of view, is this something that you think is going to be appealing to many people? I mean, I, I don't think there's a, a ton of correlation appeal to terror. Cyber, on the other hand could have some benefit. But again, that's correlation within a fund manager's book, not necessarily correlation relative to the end investor's overall book. And that's something to keep in mind, right? If the ILS fund is the diversifying play, then, you know, how much correlation would the end investor or how much diversification would the end investor want there? It's, you know, it's not a straightforward dynamic. You know, the, the issue for PV that I keep hearing in the ILS market comes down to rate. You know, can, can you write low rate online business? Maybe a little, but, you know, after a while, you, you got to make some money, right? If you're returning to, if you're writing two, three online business, you're, you know, you're, you're paying your rent, you know, you're paying your people and, and that's about it. So you need to find a product that um, generates kind of eight up through double digit online. Cool. Uh, That at the same time, a buyer is willing to pay for and can pay for. So if something like PV, and we're seeing this in cyber as well, uh, a lot of folks who are writing the business get trapped because they're writing low rate online business. And to hedge meaningfully, they have to seriously invade the premiums they've collected. And I mean, you and I have been talking about this in cyber and probably PV for several years now. Um, And the only thing that's changed is the eminence of the risk, which is probably the worst thing that could be the only thing to change. And so if, if the ILS market were to get involved, I mean, what's obviously you mentioned ILWs, um, but how how do you, how do you foresee these sorts of things being structured and what kind of triggers are people going to be looking at? I mean, the, the timing is really interesting, right? Because last year we saw a lot of securitized ILWs, 144A format for the first time. 
uh, particularly the the trades that include PCS Japan, right? Th- that was kind of this milestone in taking ILWs and just wrapping them in 144A. And we've seen similar stuff with uh, private cap funds in the past, right? Where you just take and securitize an ILW. Um, given how much experience the ILS market has with that, I think, yeah, it could make a lot of sense to do probably a private cat bond for Terror PV. Uh, there was the, um, the the Baltic recap bond a few years ago that was Terror uh, and 144A. It was small, it, it was narrow, UK only. Um, but to see something broader, like a global Terror in a private cap bond, I think is utterly realistic. And I think it'd make a lot more sense. Uh, again, it, it's the same ILW that's been traded and we found ways to make the wordings even more robust than they've ever been. Um, so it's just a matter of, yeah, can, can we find a, a private cap bond format for this? Uh, the bigger, and as far as structure goes, PCS trigger, no problem. There's been lots of PCS global terror trading over the past few years. And even before that, lots of PCS US trading um, for US only off the, off the cap product. So utterly doable. It's going to come down, I think, to rate and strike. Uh, rate's got to be high enough to fit with the ILS fund model. And that's you know something that folks have to understand. Like a collateralized product, an illiquid product, is, you know, has certain constraints. If you can make that product liquid, maybe you can work with the rate a little bit, which is why I like the idea of a private cap on for, for global terror. As far as strikes, it's all over the map. I mean, a strike price for PV, I mean, anything under two and a half is kind of close to the money, if not in the money, right? You, you've had two and a half breached every year for the past three years. That's, you know, for SRCC, that, that's no joke. I and mean, that's difficult. Um, Two and a half billion terror has been breached once in the past 30. That was 9 11. I mean, if you drop down to two, you've got Bishop's Gate adjusted for inflation um, triggering. It's about it. Um, with the emergent BI risk, I mean, I, I see SRCC for the ILS market tough to take under five as a trigger, I'm guessing. Mm. Um, you know, a, a three to four is kind of punchy. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how I see things forming. I mean, I'd probably have almost a pillared approach to SRCC separate from terror, separate from cyber terror. What do you think about aggregates? Um, cause obviously if you're talking potentially multiple smaller dollar value events around the world, is there value in? And do people do people trade terror and political violence RLWs on an aggregate basis? So accumulating global losses over the course of a year, or I haven't heard of that. And no. I, I mean, I just kind of imagined the response I'd get. I mean, that's tricky, right? If you're talking like a, a 500 million franchise deductible on a two and a half billion dollar um, ag, mm. that's even on terror. That's nerve wracking. Um, on SRCC, uh, you're, you're trading dollars at that point. I, I think yeah. that's probably a non-starter, yeah. Yeah, it's a challenging thing to, to structure, it seems. But I think the appetite is definitely there. And it's interesting you mentioned earlier about sort of the ILS fund correlation or decorrelation mandate versus the actual end investor. And increasingly, the end investors I talk with are looking for differentiation within the market. And that is one of the subjects we'll be talking about in April at the conference. And areas of risk like this are appealing to a lot of investors who they find the risk, the binary nature of triggers, the insured nature, the diversifying factor, rather than it being completely remote from the rest of the economy. And that seems to be something that large investors are becoming much more and more accommodating of now. So I think I think bodes well for the future for products in this area. I, I, I hope, I mean, I, I do think we're gonna see some trading in Q1 uh, just because so much PV has been written mm. that 
it, it's going to be difficult to ignore. Um, and, and I think folks are gonna have to make some tough decisions while negotiating those strikes. And ultimately it means you know, the underlying buyer is not gonna get all the cover they want. No hedge is perfect, right? Just by definition. And protection sellers are gonna have to take on a bit more risk than they'd like, which, well, okay. I mean, if you're collecting premium, it's ostensibly because you're taking risk. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think we, it's difficult to move out of your comfort zone for man-made in particular, especially for PV, um, because there is so little history uh, or so little historical data um, with the exception of the past three years, which have been pretty hot. So yeah. it, it's, it's not an easy market to enter. Um, but I, I think societally, it's more important than ever. And insurance does have a societal mission. You know, it's always important to remember that. And, and then on top of that, I, I think that, you know, clients in need always represent a business opportunity. And, and it's time to think about how we deliver on client need in a way that it drives uh, sustainable profitability. It's what, as an industry, we should always be thinking about. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great way to end the conversation. Thank you, Tom. Um, so look, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time today. Great to see you as ever. Likewise, Steve, absolutely. So just for Thanks. our viewers, we'll have Tom moderating a panel at the conference in April. Um, Tom will actually be moderating a panel on ESG and climate risk, so completely the other opposite end of the spectrum, but um, do get your ticket to be able to attend. Um, so thanks again, Tom, and look forward to seeing you at the event in April as well. Thanks, Steve. Likewise.